Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to day nine of this special program on humanity rising, uh, dealing with the conference of parties uh, that is going on uh, in Glasgow and has been uh, in continuous operation since the 1st of, of November. That's when Humanity Rising started uh, and continues uh, for the next several days, concluding on the 12th of November uh, this Friday. Uh, over the time that we have uh, been covering uh, the Conference of Parties, uh, we have been hearing from people there in Glasgow, both inside the conference and outside the conference. Over the weekend, we uh, heard from various climate activists. There were uh, at least 100, if not 150,000 people on the streets on Saturday and Sunday in a massive uh, demonstration of frustration uh, due to the fact that the government's uh, yet again uh, in this 26th year of the COP uh, are uh, doing what they always do, uh, engaging in platitudes uh, while kicking the ball down the road for someone else later uh, to deal with the problem. Um, uh, the problem being that we have run out of time. And as the Secretary General said in August in preparation uh, for this COP, uh, we are now in code red. We're now in the climate tipping point. We're now in a situation in which escalating ecological turbulence is no longer avoidable. Uh, and that's something we all need to consider, uh, everyone, as we begin to wind down the uh, program on climate change on our ninth uh, day. Uh, we've covered a lot of different issues, as you all know. Uh, yesterday, it was on the cities as regeneration hubs for Gaia. Uh, today, we're going to uh, deal with the oceans, which is uh, probably the largest tipping point uh, in terms of size uh, currently uh, happening around our, our precious uh, planet. Before we launch into our program, I think it's always good as we always do on Humanity Rising as we begin our sessions, just simply to pause and just take a moment and center yourself in your body. Take a breath and align yourself with your heartbeat. Just take a moment, just a minute to attune yourself with your own heart. See if you can listen and hear your heartbeat in a spirit of gratitude and deep thanksgiving that you're alive. We're all alive at this most extraordinary moment in the human journey.
Thank you, everyone. Now with an open heart and a heart full of gratitude for each and every one of you who are joining our session today, uh, I want to uh, begin our program uh, before we turn to the oceans, uh, to uh, a couple, uh, Basha Alexander and Jim Conroy, who have been in the Northern California forest fire regions, along with people coming in from Glasgow uh, each day. They have been traveling uh, around the uh, forest fires in the Northern California. Uh, and so I thought we would start uh, before we move to the oceans, just to contemplate the devastation that's occurring uh, in our forests, uh, particularly here in uh, Northern California. So I turn it over to Basha and Jim. Oh, thank you so much, Jim. We thank really, you, Jim. We really appreciate this opportunity. Um, so our motto is heal ecological damage, upgrade people's thinking. We have created a unique system of energy healing for trees and ecosystems, which we also teach. Our approach is to connect, communicate, collaborate, and co-create with the life force and intelligence of nature by using bioenergy overlap and interactions in consciousness. Jim. I'm Jim Conroy. And what I did is uh, yesterday, right in the Caldor fire, while I was in, a, in the zone working on the fire, I uh, made a short video, short, very short video. And I'd like just to play that video for you. And it'll describe what our work, what we did in that fire. And I am looking for it now. Here we go. Share there. Okay. Good afternoon. Today is November 8th. And we're in the Caldor fire near Pollock Pines, California. So what, uh, so let me tell you a little bit about the work we had to do here with these trees, okay? First of all, it's important to understand that before the fire happened, these trees were already weak. Due to pollution and primarily pollution, they weren't able to make enough food for themselves. Then what happened when they weren't able to make enough food for themselves, they were more susceptible to climate change. So you had that, you kind of had a double whammy on the trees. So they were caught in this cycle of not making enough food, not enough growth, not, not enough, yeah, not enough growth, not making enough food, not enough growth, not making enough food. That's kind of what they were doing. All right. That was kind of the cycle they were in all of the trees. Okay. Now we have two situations now after the fire. And we've worked on both these situations in here. First, the trees that have some green on them, okay? Those trees, we work with the trees to increase photosynthesis, to make more food and bring them back into a loop where they're making more food to support themselves, which means more growth, okay? And, 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 uh, and then more food, okay? Kind of, kind of that loop, okay? Kind of that loop so that they would become healthier trees. Okay, that's, that's, we work with the internal functionality of the trees in order to do this. All right. The other situation we had was trees that are burnt. Well, they aren't as fortunate because they got a little more harder work to do. But what they have to do is, is break down some stored food because they don't, they don't have any food in there. They're not doing photosynthesis right now. They've got some stored food. They have to break down that stored food, drive some, drive some circulation, drive food and fluid out to tissues that can differentiate into new buds, either leaf buds or needle buds, depending on what the type of the tree is, okay? And then those buds would then grow into leaves or needles, and then that would create more food for the tree, and it would gradually begin a cycle of enough food, start making food for itself, and start to get healthier and it could grow more. And, and so make a little more food, grow a little bit more, make a little more food, grow a little more, and then come back and actually eventually come into that first cycle I talked to you about, which was increased photosynthesis, 
get the food, really get it going, you know, really pump up the photosynthesis so they really have a, le- a good amount of food. And then that creates more growth, more food for the tree. And then, and then eventually you bring back the whole forest as a nice, equal, healthy forest. That's what you want to have. So you have both the green trees, they'll be healthy, and the ones that burnt in that can, the ones that burnt, I mean, some of them are so crispy, they'll, they won't come back. But those that have the ability to come back can, can break down food and differentiate tissue and put on new leaves and needles and, and make our food. So that's what we were up to in, um, in, in, this, in this Caldor fire. And that's the work we did. And, and repair that internal functionality to do that in both those, the trees that were green, still green, and the trees that were that were burnt but could recover. Thank you. Great. Great. And and we'll take any discussion or any questions anybody might have. Well, thank you. I think we have a very full program today, uh, uh, Jim and Bashev. So uh, I will uh, thank you for that. And uh, we'll uh, probably uh, be in touch with you over the next couple of days as you uh, complete your journey there. But on behalf of all of us, I really want to thank uh, you very deeply for everything that you're doing to nurture the trees under this extraordinary situation of duress. Uh, as, uh, as you said, they're experiencing a double whammy. Uh, sounds like um, most of the planet, actually, uh, the oceans yeah, are yeah. also yeah. Uh, exactly. starving while they're warming uh, and the two are interactive uh, together. So that situation uh, is refracted throughout most of the planetary ecology, I'm afraid. Uh, but thank you so much for everything that you've done uh, to contribute also to our program and we over the last couple of days. So thank you. Thank you. And we and we have a um, and we have a, another another discussion for another day with you concerning the um, the purpose of the fires, both the Dixie fire and the uh, Caldor fire. What the purpose of those fires were, and we want to we'll bring that into you. Okay, another day. Thank you. Well, um, our main website is partnerwithnature.org, and Dr. Jim's website is the treewhisperer.com. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Now I'd like to uh, turn it over to my good friend and colleague, uh, Ed Muller, who you all know is the uh, president of the University of International Cooperation uh, in Costa Rica, also the founder of Regenerate uh, Costa Rica, who's been very active globally on issues related to biodiversity uh, and regeneration uh, for many, many years. Uh, And this is the uh, third of four panels that he's convening uh, for the Humanity Rising special program on the COP. So Ed, thank you so much. And I turn the program over to you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, This has been fun setting up this session. Uh, The ocean is so important, but there are not too many people really doing good stuff, and most of them are very busy. So I'm really happy that we have uh, Max and Randall, and actually Carolina uh, Ramirez, who's hopefully going to join us. Apparently, there was a a short circuit in her town, and they're out of electricity, so there's no Wi-Fi, no internet. So she called me on the cell phone, and she's driving to somewhere to see if she can connect. Um, I'll just show a few very uh, quick introductory slides. because this, the, the oceans are really uh, a center point of humanity's existence and the planetary existence. And um, we are looking at a lot of negative news, acidification, the dead spots. I mean, the, the marine dead spots or dead zones are increasing so rapidly. Uh, the acidification of the oceans, the uh, leaching, we've seen the big reefs just die off over a few days. But I'm not going to go into that negative part. Uh, we have so much positive happening. And the message today from our speakers is what are things that are happening? So we already crossed the barrier. Uh, 
of traditional management of nature. Um, because in the case of oceans, a little bit less than half the population of the planet depends on the oceans for their livelihoods. And these communities have to be involved. They have to be part of the process. This cannot be something that's designed from the government or from a bingo, a big international NGO organization. Uh, and we've learned that. We've also learned the ridge to reef. Um, so in my country, every time it rains, this is what happens to the ocean. And uh, of course, the, the surfers are pissed off and the divers are, are not very happy because they cannot see through that water. But just think about the amount of soil that you have to pump into the rivers and pump into the ocean to turn a huge part of our coast to brown color. Uh, our countries are losing up to 200 tons of topsoil per hectare per year. That's about 30 trucks uh, full of uh, soil that are dumped into the rivers. So we are advancing and understanding that we cannot just work on the ocean without bringing the top of the mountain into the, the work we're doing. Um, we also have learned that conservation is coming through the use. So we're actually seeing very many success stories of local fishermen actually bringing the fisheries back if they're allowed to work with nature and the conservation of many different uh, areas that are actually protected by local communities. And the Biosphere Reserve Network of UNESCO has been a, a good example for this. It's actually a lot of the big corporations that are uh, not respecting these uh, rights. And we see the case in my country where the tuna fisheries have traditionally just plundered our, our fish stock and what they pay in, in terms of license and fees is really nothing. Um, so we've, we've gone there. In terms of corals, uh, this is my passion. Actually, the picture on top is one of my aquariums a few years ago when I had time to take care of reefs. A lot of the coral breeding processes have been learned from a hobby not from scientists. And now it's coming into the scientific world of coral restoration, regeneration. David was gonna be with us, but he's now on his way uh, between two islands in the South Pacific. Uh, he's doing the uh, regeneration of, of coral reefs there. Um, and Valerie was also uh, invited to come, but they just got spawning and they're doing re reproductive uh, propagation of sexual re reproduction of corals uh, in, in Curaçao. So she couldn't join us, but the reef uh, reconstruction is advancing tremendously. David told me they have the genomes of many of the coral species and varieties in the Caribbean mapped out. And they're now able to actually select corals to uh, restore the reefs that are have genes that are more resilient to bleaching, more resilient to warm waters, more resilient to acidification. So we have a chance to actually help, help nature with technology regenerate itself. And this, this gives me a lot of hope that my children can still, and my grandchildren can still see the abundance of life and not only in their living rooms with an aquarium like this one. And um, I'm proud to say that again, Costa Rica put its, uh, head in front in, at the COP. And this is actually not a new project. Uh, I actually worked on, on part of this initial phase about 10, 15 years ago, uh, but uniting one of the most important and biodiverse areas of Colombia, Panama, Ecuador, and Costa Rica with the Galapagos Islands, the Cocos Islands, Malpelo, Gorgona, and Cohiba. Of, which is a corridor for sharks and for a lot of other uh, species. So um, my good friend Randall will come and, and tell us a bit more about how and why are the, these sharks so important and the protection of these areas are fundamental. This is uh, areas that are constantly invaded by uh, illegal fishing, piracy, and so much. So um, we're, we're looking at hope in regenerating the future of the planet by working with the oceans. 
So I would like to invite a good friend who I haven't seen in a long time. This is actually the first time I'll see him um, on video, Max. Um, I was engaged with several projects with Max back when he was in forestry in Southern Chile. And Max is now um, doing some marvelous stuff in terms of the ocean. So I'll pass it on to you, Max. Maybe you can say a few words about yourself and Mission Blue. Uh, we all know Mission Blue. It's um, a huge initiative uh, from one of the ladies that I most admire. Um, so Max, just please go ahead and tell us a few things about what's happening there and what your vision is and all your work. Sure. Um, thank you so much. Edward. It's also a pleasure to see you. You're um, um, a good, dear friend of mine, and, and I really admire what you have done in your life. You were also my teacher when I was at the university there. I, I am very proud to have been uh, actually, um, you know, been through the university there in Costa Rica. I learned a lot of stuff from you and many other great people there. And then also having the possibility of uh, have, um, sharing this uh, with Randall, which is a very good old friend of mine too. And um, it's one of my heroes too. And so it's, it, it's great to be all together. And that's how we should work. No? I mean, I think this is uh, about cooperation and, and how we actually leave the egos um, behind uh, because it's not about us. Um, it's not about even our organizations. It's about everyone and it's about the ocean and the ocean it's the actual um you know force that has been driving life in on earth and you know if we, we should have called the planet earth the planet ocean actually it's where life comes from and most biodiversity uh, biggest sequester um sinking you know um of uh, carbon um, it's the 50% of the historical oxygen is being produced there. I mean, it's everything, everything we are, everything we will become, it's coming from the ocean. So thank you so much um, uh, for the presentation. Um, and, and it's a pleasure uh, for me to share with from, from Glasgow, as you, you see, I escape here a little bit um, uh, from, the, from the meetings and all the stuff. Uh, and it's a pleasure for me to be with you here and sharing what we are doing. Oh, collectively with Randall, with you, Elder, with many others, and how, how we protect this amazing corridor. Thank you. Do you want me to continue talking about yeah, this? Just, or you want... just, just okay. go ahead and, and yeah, and awesome. talk your part, and then I'll pass it to Randall. Yeah. So, um, for a long time, many scientists have been showing us information about the connectivity in this region. There goes a far beyond the, this announcement that you might have seen in uh, last Tuesday here uh, at COP26. Um, Ecuador, Colombia, Costa Rica, and Panama, uh, kicked also by the um, Panama a couple months ago, um, a campaign that I also lead there um, uh, for a couple of years. They are starting to extend their marine protected area so they can reach out to their borders and then they can connect as one area. This will be uh, the first multinational marine protected area. And I think it's just a reflection on how we should be looking into conservation now. You know, when, when you look into, into the numbers, um, when you see, for example, the industry, the, the, the tuna fleet industry, they think globally, you know, they, they, they have vessels in Vanuatu, they have vessels in the Indian Ocean, they have vessels all around the world, why we are not thinking the same way? Why we are not thinking, you know, we are always thinking like, I'm going to take this little piece of the ocean, but I might going to be protected or not. I might going to still let, you know, some fishing. 3% of the ocean is highly and fully protected, which are the areas that actually the, um, uh, the scientist says that they are the most valuable. They produce seven times more biomass. They produce more, uh, you know, resilient for the ocean. They, they, they are a source of uh, biodiversity. We have proved uh, marine protected areas to work for many years, actually. The Polynesian have uh, tried them for more than a thousand years. They call them Rahui, they call them Tapus. I mean, they, there are many names and many places. Communities before us, they've tried marine protected areas. 
So yes, it's a three percent, and as Sylvia always will say, you know, I have I have two um, two news. No, one one bad, one good. Uh, the bad news is we have three percent. The good news is we have three percent. It depends on how we look into these things, no. And I think we have we are in such an important moment in history, in humanity. We, you, Edward, and many others, all the people that are looking at here, and many other there are now in this moment in humanity and history, we have the capacity to change for good, to change the world, to change the way that we've been communicating, we, we're, we've been relating with nature. And I think this moment, we need to use it. We have the power. Now we know that we can change. Now we know that actually we've been damaging the ocean and we still have an, a functional ocean. And that is the key thing. We haven't lost the battle. We should not lo lose it because we are in a, in a moment where we can change things. So I think the, the possibilities that open so this multinational uh, marine protected area in a region that even had issues before in terms of frontiers, Ecuador and, and Costa Rica for a long time, they were fighting where was the, you know, the, the line that divided them. Now they're thinking of a binational marine protected area there. I mean, what a beautiful news, you no? Know, from that sort of like um, more aggressive sort of way and to see what is mine, what is yours, now thinking about what is ours or, or actually is not even ours. It's, it belongs to the world itself, you no? Know? And so now the question is like, how far we can go? Is it we need to go further? My dreams, and I like to dream bigger. Um, I've been dreaming about this, and I know you, Edward, and many others, and Branda in particular, have been dreaming about this news. It's bigger than this. Um, this is a great step, and I think we have so much to work. We need to recognize also, and we need to stop sometimes looking in the back. You know, Sometimes you walk and walk, and you see far away where you need to get, and you feel like, oh, God, it's so far. But then when you look back, and you see how much you've been actually walking, you realize, wow, I, I did it. We did it. We walk all this way here. And so why not to get there? No? And I think we need to recognize this is incredible moment, this incredible step now to get to get in this communication, this incredible announcement. And now what else? There's the high seas. The high seas cover 60% of the oceans. So 70% of the earth is covered by, by water. Of that, 60% it's outside of the economic exclusive zones of the, of, the, of the countries. That means there is a huge part that we still lose for, and we need to continue working on that. Um, so I wanted to thank you um, all. Um, I want to give you a, um, a message of hope, a message of um, accomplishment, we are all part of this. When we talk about the ocean, you, if you like to breathe, well, you, then you need to, you know, take care of the ocean. Everybody likes to breathe. And at least one of those two breath belongs to the ocean. So we need to give thanks to the ocean and we need to give back to the ocean. And no matter how far you are, if you live in the Sierra, in the mountains, whatever, you're still connected with the ocean. You always will be. So let's give back something to the ocean. Let's, some, let's do something together and feel part of this accomplishment because it's everyone. Not me, not one institution, but everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Thank you for inspiring us. And uh, thank you for taking the time of escaping your commitments there at Glasgow um, to talk with us. I'll pass it on right to Randall. Uh, Randall has been an inspiration for me. Uh, the work he does, uh, I mean, it's, it's I, I, I hear a voice that probably keeps our president uh, awake at night uh, of having to answer to Randall's things from time to time. Uh, but he's also a brilliant scientist and uh, doing some really great work. So Randall, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Edward. And and hi, everybody, and good morning, here in Costa Rica, at least. <laughs> and yes, this was a very encouraging announcement from um, coming from the COP in the four countries, Costa Rica, Colombia, Ecuador, and Panama. You know, and what it really was, though, was a commitment. It was an agreement 
Uh, it doesn't really mean anything yet, but I guess it, it's going to depend on us for it to mean something. Um, Edward, you just now mentioned that you were involved with this process in 2004. And I would just like to remind everybody too that in 2004, a, a statement pretty much the same as the one that was just signed was signed by the ministers of the environment of these four countries. And pretty much the same statement that, you know, we were going to do the research that we were going to work together through the ministries of environment to, to identify these corridors and to protect them and to protect these highly migratory marine species that were in urgent need of this protection. And, you know, this was 17 years ago. And now we have the same commitment emanating from the same countries. And I think the value in this commitment is that we have to tell these presidents, okay, this commitment needs to be turned into actions. And we need these actions now. We, you know, these, these commitments aren't really going to take us anywhere, just like action plans, strategies, you know, and then plans and plans are not going to take us anywhere either. We have plenty of all of these. And now the time to act is now, you know, we, we, we really have to emphasize that, especially like a country like Costa Rica. Uh, Costa Rica is a leader. It's a natural leader. When people talk about Costa Rica, they think about ecotourism, conservation of nature. And the current president only has a few months to pull this off. We have elections in February. And whatever it doesn't get pulled off now means starting from zero again next year. So the issue is impelling, and we need the Costa Rican government to act now. If we look at Ecuador, well, Ecuador already made the announcement that 30% or 30,000 square kilometers are going to be extended for an exclusive no-take area to connect with Costa Rica. Great announcement. Uh, Panama already created a greater marine protected area covering 30% covering of its EEZ. Um, uh, Colombia also has extended its marine protected areas around Malpelo. So all these countries have already taken decisive steps towards this. But when we look at Costa Rica, Costa Rica right now only has a 2,000 square kilometer no-take area around Cocos Island, which doesn't compare with Malpelo's 27,000 no-take. And it definitely doesn't compare with Ecuador's 130,000 square reserve around Galapagos. So Costa Rica is lagging behind and it's really got to step it up now. And I think that's the message. If Costa Rica signed this agreement, uh, the president did, you know, fantastic. Let's move on. And right now, Costa Rica is in a process in which negotiations are still being held. Uh, discussions are still being held with the fishing sector. The fishing sector has been a, a great opponent to this initiative. And, you know, the science is there. I've been working on the science for, for years. Uh, the science is there. The technical justification is there. We're talking about critically endangered species like leatherback turtles, hammerhead sharks. And being on the critically endangered list means these species only have 20 years for action and or otherwise they're going to go extinct. We cannot allow that to happen. And when animals are critically endangered, that means we need critical measures to save them. It doesn't mean we can slow down on the catch or we can start managing the catch or we need better information to act. It means if we don't need to act now, they're going to be gone. And we can't allow that to happen. And with the leatherback turtles, they entered the critically endangered list 20 years ago. And they're more endangered now than ever. We keep on seeing their numbers dwindle. And hammerhead sharks were listed critically endangered two years ago. And we still need to act. So my call here is just an impelling call to all these four governments. Let's get our act together. And especially, let's, let's gang up on Costa Rica. Costa Rica is lagging behind. And we need Costa Rica to be that leader that everybody expects it to be. And you know, once Costa Rica takes the lead on these issues, lots of countries follow. Let's remember in 2013, um, Costa Rica took the lead to protect hammerhead sharks under the Convention for the International Trade of Endangered Species at CITES. And I remember when Costa Rica took this lead, Brazil jumped on board right away. And I remember many countries and, and even colleagues saying, Randall, this isn't gonna happen. It's gonna be too hard to put hammerhead sharks on Appendix 2. It's gonna be an uphill battle, but we did it. it. It was an uphill battle, but we won by five votes. Remember, CITES is 177 countries. 
It, you need to win by a two third majority. It was a monumental battle, but we won and we listed hammerhead sharks. This other battle that's coming up, creating these corridors, making them no take and providing these animals with the, with the conservation policies that they need is another battle, but we're in that battle right now. And this is why it's so important for Costa Rica to step it up and uh, follow up with this agreement that Costa Rica just signed. If we signed it, we got to do it. We got to do it now and we got to do it before the next couple of months because time is the limiting factor. So, you know, let, let's take advantage of this call and let's let's move forward with this. And why is it important that we have sharks? Tell us a little bit about the, the physiology of the ocean and, and why sharks are so critical uh, for the oceans, why every second breath, as Max said, is produced by the ocean. And that only happens if we have sharks actually in the system. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the important thing about sharks is it's not an imminent extinction. It's not, it, it's something that's happening right before our eyes. And, you know, the, the, these populations are plummeting. We, we know it's a huge problem. Uh, countries are addressing the problem. You know, we have uh, conventions, you know, and that they're supposed to save these animals, but we're not seeing these actions land on the ground and we need these actions now. And the reason why the sharks are so important is because, you know, they're, they're the architects of the ecosystem. You know, we always say they're the apex predators. They're on the, they're on the very top of the, of the food chain. And as such, they exert all these pressures on the animals that they feed on. And you know, if we look at a very simple food chain, you have the apex predators, you have the meso predators, which are like snappers, other shark species, rays that are also predatory animals, but they get eaten by the sharks. But then underneath these meso predators, you have the algae feeders and the, the lower animals in the, in, the, in, the, in the ecosystem. So basically what happens is once you remove the sharks, then you have these changes in the ecosystem where the meso, meso predators don't have any animals checking in on, on their populations. So once the apex predator is gone, these meso predators and the relationships in between them start changing. And now some of these animals start reproducing at higher rates than they should, and they start outcompeting other meso predators. And what happens is you end up with lower diversity. Remember a very important principle in the tropics is diversity fosters diversity. So if you have a diversity of predators, you have a diversity of preyed upon. But once you don't have that diversity of predators, the preyed upon predators diminish in, 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 in their diversity. And then what happens underneath them? If you start having too many of these, if one of these missile predators starts taking over, then they become too abundant and they start feeding on too many of these animals underneath them. And then you start having the disbalances in the ecosystem, which can have impacts on the whole productivity of the ocean. So for instance, there's many examples, but I'm just gonna um, show you a few. For instance, you have a coral reef. You remove the apex predators from the coral reef, and then what happens? There start being too many meso predators because there's no one controlling their population. And then the meso predators eat all the algae feeders. And then if there's no algae feeders, the reef becomes uh, overtaken by the algae. And then by removing the sharks, you end up with reefs that are um, conquered by nothing but algae because of the absence of the algae feeders. So it's it's always a, a chain of events going down. For instance, in Costa Rica, we have another good example. We are studying the bull sharks in river mouths. And there's an area I work in where there's a very productive snapper fishery. The, the area is surrounded by mangrove swamps and, and the mangrove serves, uh, serve as rookeries for small snappers. And it's also a rookery for the bull sharks. Well, sometimes people come and fish in these river mouths and they catch baby bull sharks and they kill them. And they think, oh, the baby bull sharks are, or these juveniles take the bait, they're a pain. And, you know, they, they want to get rid of these sharks. They, they don't like them. They're bad for the fishery, they say. But now that we've been doing these studies with stable isotopes, we can tell the fishermen, hey, wait a moment. A moment. Um, do you know what the bull sharks are eating? The bull sharks are eating catfish, which are also very abundant. Um, well, what are the catfish eating? Well, we're doing the stomach content analysis now, but we're seeing that the catfish are eating lots of little fish and they're eating, and they're eating necessarily sometimes baby snappers. 
So if you're interested in the fishery, what's going to happen if you remove all the bull sharks when you're fishing in these river mouths? Well, no, no way, nobody's going to control the catfish populations. So then the catfish populations are going to re reproduce out of control. And what if they start eating too many of the baby snappers? That can impact the commercial snapper fishery. So these are uh, connections that we can infer that could happen with the uh, absence of these apex predators. Once you remove the apex predators, everything underneath the ecosystem is going to start shifting and the changes in the ecosystem could mean not such good fisheries. So in a nutshell, what we need are healthy ecosystems with their diversity of predators. So we have the diversity of preyed upon underneath them under control. So we have all these elements in the ecosystem. And let's remember, biodiversity conservation is a human right because for the ocean to provide these ecosystem services that we need, they need to be healthy. And being healthy means they need all the elements of the ecosystem. We need the biodiversity. So conserving our apex predators is conserving biodiversity and it's preserving the human rights of the people and everyone who depends on the marine ecosystem for its ecosystem services, which is all of humanity. Yeah, I think uh, I remember in the year 2000 or something like that, when the, the Biosphere Reserve in Seaflower uh, in Colombia was established, which was at the time 10% of the Caribbean before the court in, uh, in the Hague gave part of that marine territory to Nicaragua. But um, working with the fishing communities, they opposed it severely. And then five years later, they were the biggest defenders and they wanted more no-take zones because their fisheries just pop back. And, and that's what we don't understand. It's the same thing. And I see many of the, of the traditional policies which are actually not doing good, like... Um, Everybody says we have to catch the big fish and, and release the small fish. Well, a big female can produce 5 million eggs, whereas a small female can produce 100,000 eggs. So we take only the big ones. We're actually taking those that are reproducing most and, and, and not allowing for the population. So these no-take zones, they actually, and, and you're more of an expert than I, but maybe you or Max can say something about it. What has happened with these protected areas is that the fish stocks raise recover so quickly, just like they did in our coast during COVID when, when fishermen weren't allowed to go out uh, and fish stocks just came back really quickly, that they get start getting overpopulated in the protected no-take zones and they start migrating out and replenishing the fisheries. So this dynamics, I think, has to be incorporated into our way of thinking. It's this holistic approach. Uh, when I see linear actions like fertilizing with iron so that the algae can fix the CO2 and revert climate change with that without looking at the consequences of putting all this iron into the oceans and affecting the whole uh, food chain afterwards. I mean, how do we actually change our, our, our way of looking at science from all these wrong measures to looking at it as a real evolving process of nature that has millions of years for us to learn from. I just hand well, it on I've, to whoever you, okay. you know. I would just like to add to that, that I've worked with a lot of types of fishermen. I've worked with shrimp trawlers, I've worked with longliners, and I've worked with small scale fishermen. And, and there's a huge difference. Uh, when I work with small, fisher, with small scale fishermen, you're talking to a, a small fisherman who has his own panga or probably a few pangas, uh, small boats, and, and they get it. You know, that they get marine protected areas, they get the they get sustainability, you know, they know that there's times of the year when they shouldn't fish. They know that they they understand about all these things when I talk to them. They know the value of marine protected areas and of protecting them strictly. Uh, there it's it's a group that that is just more open to these uh, types of management. When I've been working with the large fishermen, though, usually I'm dealing with a businessman who's not on his boat. Uh, or, you know, he, he, he contracts his boat or some other, somebody else works on his boat. These are people who are in debt. And these are people who, you know, they, they might get sustainability, but their main problem is economic. You know, they've, they, they went through a period of, of big economic success a couple of days ago, a couple of decades ago. They missed those days and they want them to come back. 
And, you know, they don't, they think sometimes in their own mind that there's too much conservation already, that conservation is their problem. That, you know, that if the conservationists would go away, fisheries would rebound and be back the way they used to be because they can't fish the way they used to because of all about these conservation measures. And, you know, and, and that's the problem because these people, at least in Costa Rica and most of these countries, are the ones responsible for establishing fishery policy. And these are the ones who have been resistant to, to these changes. So, you know, that these are the changes that need to be done. And yes, we need to address many of these um, issues and, you know, how fisheries get better by, by closing down some of these fisheries and the fisheries will actually get better outside of them. And, you know, the small scale fishermen, again, they get it, but the small, the big guys, you know, for them, this is a matter of too much conservation and they just want to keep on fishing. And it's kind of like things are going to get better if we keep on doing things the way we've always done them. We're, we're going to get different results with the same kind of procedures that we've done forever. And of course, we need to change and things will get better. You know, fisheries will get better if we start implementing these conservation measures. But things aren't going to get better if we keep, keep on doing things the way we've done them forever. But again, this is, this is a political problem that's, that's very enrooted in our countries. And, you know, again, we have to take advantage of, of our, you know, the commitments of our presidents, of our presidents to, to improve these marine conservation policies. Well, well, let's adopt them and let's put our garments on the spot. And, you know, things will get better for fisheries. You know, there's definitely a crisis, but the crisis is because of overfishing. The crisis is not because of over conservation, like sometimes they want to make us feel. Um, so over I to you. To, yeah, I, I, you know, I wanted to add to one of the craziest thing also, you know, to see that um, um, a fish doesn't have a value until you, you have killed it. No, I mean, <laughs> then, then it has a price in the market, then you can make uh, money out of it. What is the price of uh, living fish? <laughs> What is the price of actually leaving that fish in the water? No? And, and when you understand what you know, Randall was saying, there are communities that actually they're more vulnerable and they live directly from, from um, consuming those fish that actually sustain their families and everything. But, but this other group, which is the in industry, the fish basically for luxury, no? I mean, the people who have the capacity of buying tuna, it's really people who have money to actually decide whether they want to eat tuna or something else. Um, just let's look at the salmon farming, you know, and uh, I'm from Chile, and, and of course we have a huge impact of uh, the salmon farming producing. For what? It's, it's not for food security, it's not for people that need to eat salmon. It's for being in, you know, in the sushi, it's for being in, in a, you know, someone else um, plate on a, a fancy restaurant. That, that, that is that what we are talking, no? And so the, the key also is to think, is that necessary? Do we really need to do that to the, to the ocean? I mean, again, like what Sylvia normally says is the, the most important thing we extract from the ocean is our own existence. And if, if we keep, you know, thinking about how do we make money out of this? How do we, it, that's not the answer. That, that is not the point is how we actually live with the ocean as we've been doing it for millions of years and how we actually change our attitude toward the ocean and just not making money out of it, but actually saving it because of our own sort of existence. I hear you, Max. And, and um, when, I, when I started out, I said 3 billion people's livelihoods depend on the ocean. So it's, it's I saw in one of the comments, uh, let's turn vegan for 10 years and, and get the oceans back. Well, a lot of these 3 billion people would starve uh, to get the oceans back. So, and it, as Randall said, they are the ones that are conscious about uh, the fishing uh, policies and, and what they need to do to conserve the fisheries. It's, it's, it's a lot of the big, big fisheries that are actually doing a lot of the damage. And the same thing in Chile. I mean, it's a big companies that don't respect. And just three years ago, 700 uh, salmons escaped from one company. And if they managed to fish 10% with nobody controlling them, they were off the hook. So they had to catch 7,000 salmons back, report it. Nobody was there counting the salmons that they caught back 
and they were off the hook with fines and everything else. And they can go on destroying the, the ecosystem. And we see these salmon fisheries going from the mid-south Chile all the way now into Tierra del Fuego because they already killed the ecosystems up, up north. Uh, so when are we going to actually uh, change this around? What are the good stories? So I know uh, Mission Blue is doing a lot of work for this future. Can you tell us a, a few things about beautiful, inspiring initiatives that you're all Okay. Well, I, I can tell you a little bit about uh, the work I'm doing on the southern Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica. And I started a project there in 1998 working on the sea turtle beaches at nesting populations. And they're not like protected areas, but they're little coastal communities that have nesting turtles on their beaches. And we started working with them so they can make a living off the turtles uh, in tourism instead of poaching the eggs and selling them in the cantinas. And the project was very successful. Now we work on five different communities. But over the years, we started working with more and more fisher, I mean, more and more of these coastal communities we ended up working with fishermen, small scale snapper fishermen that are embedded within these turtle communities. And over the years, we ended up creating two marine protected areas, um, over 50,000 square kilometers of multiple use areas. And when we started creating these areas, it was um, first to fight the shrimp trawl industry because the small scale fishermen I work with are small scale snapper fishermen. And their problem was that every time the snapper fishing got good, the shrimp trawlers would move in and catch all the snappers and it kept, of course, kept, kill a bunch of turtles. So the turtle people were upset because they were protecting turtles on the beach and dead turtles were washing up. And then the snapper fishermen were upset because the shrimp trawlers were taking all the snappers. So we decided to help them create marine protected areas, multiple use, where we could limit the fisheries, especially the snapper fisheries. And in exchange, the fishermen have allowed us to collect fishery data on their fisheries and over the years, we also went through a Marine Stewardship Council sustainability um, certification, and, and we obtained a pre-certification. We proved that the, the way that they catch their snapper is sustainable. You know, so now we're trying to work with the Ministry of the Environment and with these communities, because now we have an amalgam of five different marine protected areas under three different conservation statuses under the Ministry of the Environment. So we're trying to turn this amalgam of marine protected areas into a single unit and assist the Ministry of the Environment to work in turtle conservation, sustainable fishery, mangrove conservation. We also have bull sharks, manta rays in the region that also aggregate. So we're trying to put this all together in, in what we call a marine, um, an integrated coastal marine program, where you know we're working with the different actors and and you know protecting all these different endangered species. So you know there is hope. We're working with these communities and. You know, we, we, we want to try to develop a model on how this can be done. And just to, you know, to add a little bit more like to, you know, that, that, that there are solutions to this. It's not a matter of, you know, it, it would be great if we could just, you know, stop eating fish altogether. But we have all these small scale communities and people who also rely on the oceans. You know, we just can't cut them out. Uh, and we believe that there are ways that this can be done. Like I said, there is a small scale fisherman and there's a big scale fisherman. And for the big scale fishermen, there's also solutions. For instance, stop catching sharks and stop killing them. And that is possible. For instance, if we read now about the, the status of tunas, for instance, yellowfin tuna and other tuna, their populations are recovering. And they were actually downlisted from the endangered species list recently because these populations are being managed sustainably, apparently, and they are recovering. But the big news is, that even though these tuna populations are recovering, shark populations continue to decline. And one of the reasons is because the industrial fishermen always say, oh, well, it was bycatch. We can't do anything about these sharks anyway. It's just bycatch. So let's, con let's keep on commercializing them. What we need is a total ban on endangered shark species retention and commercialization. And this will lead towards a more organized management of these fisheries in the ocean, especially the long line fisheries. But the point is, you know, there, there are actions that can be done. And, but of course, until they're done, for instance, I don't eat fish anymore, unless it's with the fishermen I know. And I know it's a small scale fish, fishermen that caught it, you know, and we, we would like to provide these fish to other people, but I never buy fish in restaurants. I never buy fish in the supermarkets. 
because I don't know where it's coming from. And that's some recommendation I would make to most people if you're concerned about these issues. Just don't buy any fish or just don't say, oh, well, it's, you know, fish, who cares? Uh, know where your fish is coming from. And if you don't know, yeah, refrain from buying it. But there are solutions and there are ways to, to move forward. And we have to find fishermen that are willing to work this way. Um, on our side, uh, on uh, Mission Blue, we've had, um, you know, Sylvia create this uh, denomination called the uh, Hope Spots. Um, and, and it's a great idea to actually call attention for those places where we, that we need to protect, um, that there are still um, places uh, worth it to, to, to do something for them, but also that they're connected with people uh, working on them. Uh, a matter of fact, um, Randall is one of our champions, so we call them champions, uh, for Cocos Island because it's one of, I mean, he's been years and years, you know, fighting for that beautiful treasure um, Costa Rica has. Um, in the, uh, just two months ago, we got this uh, new marine protected area we mentioned before in Panama, 68,000 kilometers square of new protection, highly and fully. And I want to mention this, highly and fully are very critical. It's not how much we protect in terms of percentage, but the quality of the protection is probably more important than the, uh, than the, uh, the, 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 the number. Um, and, and so the, that quality and the, what Panama did is an incredible thing, 68,000 kilometers square. The country has 73,000 kilometers square. The area is almost as big as the country itself. And that was the keystone for getting all of this announcement that you've seen um, this week. Um, so that was an incredible thing. Chile, um, and this is one of the beautiful things that I, that I, I have the pleasure to, to say, you know, my own country, I work there for, for getting the marine protected areas. Uh, Chile have this 10th biggest economic exclusive zone on earth. And, you know, if someone would ask me 20 years ago, like, hey, where do you think it's going to be, you know, in 20 more years um, in terms of marine protection, I would, you know, or someone says it's going to be 43%, I would say like, no way, there's no way that we, we can do that, we can get that. And actually we did it. We, we did it. And so it's almost 50% of one of the biggest economic exclusive zone and they're highly and fully protection. And so those are good news that we need to celebrate. And, and I think it shows that we can do it. We can turn our um, site to, to the ocean, and it is about time we do it. Um, with people like Randall, like people like you, see what you can do. Vote for, for the people. Do what you can do, and I don't know, many of you might be from, from California. Um, California have a big step to take also on 30% 30 per, 30 of protection for um, highly and fully marine protected areas. Marine protected areas are good for the ocean, and they're good even for the fishermen. The, the, we, it's not taken out of someone. It's actually exactly the opposite. It's like going to the cash machine. If, if you think that you, if you're going to keep taking out of the cash machine forever, you, you know that it's wrong. The, 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 you, need to, you need to put money into. You need to invest. We need to invest in life. We need to invest in the ocean. And that's the only way that we, can, we will be able to survive. And this fisherman and everyone, for sure. So... There's plenty of other good stories. I invite you to follow uh, Sylvia Earl and Mission Blue and the Hope Spots to see many of those stories of many, many people that are working around the world to, to do that. Thank you. Um, I'd like to open it up to the floor if there are any questions. I've been following the chat and there's not much of questions, but if somebody has uh, some concrete questions to ask, please come forward. Um, there's so much to discuss on the ocean, uh, and we know we don't have the, the time today, but uh, please come up and ask any questions. Yeah, Jim, go ahead, please. Uh, well, first of all, Ed, uh, uh, Randall, and Max, thank you so much. It's really inspiring uh, what you're uh, speaking about. Uh, among other things, you know, I, I hadn't taken in, Ed, till you had you folks have mentioned it that you know we think of taking the big fish and leaving the little fish because we're kind of sorry for the little fish and we figure the big fish are a little older and they sort of uh, are a little bit more expendable. But you're right, uh, they're in many ways more precious 
and valuable than the little fish, um, which raises real questions about you know how we how we fish. But you know the question that I'd like to have you comment on is the ocean as a tipping point right now. You know, because we've got all kinds of tipping points out there. We passed, you know, uh, 350 parts per million, which was supposed to be the tipping point. We're now at 420. Uh, the Arctic is in irreversible melt. The ice sheet on Greenland, Antarctica is, is teetering. Um, I would love to hear your perspectives on what the tipping point means in relationship to the ocean and how, where are we in relationship to that tipping point as you understand the oceanic ecology today? That's a question on to the experts. Um, I'm only an expert in my reef aquariums, uh, <laughs> but uh, actually what's interesting is it's not one tipping point. We're at tipping points mm. with fertilizers, we're tipping points with plastic pollution and now the microplastics where, which when you yeah, yeah, yeah. eat uh, by shellfish, you're automatically ingesting a bunch of plastic. Uh, it's already affecting the whole uh, ecosystem and the value chains all the way to the humans that are eating it. Uh, we are seeing these um, red tides more and more. We're seeing the anoxic conditions spreading uh, exponentially. Uh, there are areas the Gulf of Mumbai is basically dead, and, and that's 60,000 square kilometers without oxygen because of the amount of organic pollutants that then produce the algae bloom. So there are many, many tipping points. That's acidification. We're seeing uh, some of the plankton groups that are not reaching their full body weight because of the inability to fix calcium in an in acidic condition. So the, the whole metabolism of, of calcium and carbonate is, is now affecting. And we see more and more shellfish also losing the capacity to build their, their calcium structures. We're seeing the reefs um, lose in altitude and that keeps their protection for storms coming to erode the beaches. Uh, so the reefs dying is not only a reef problem, a biodiversity problem for the reef, it's actually the impacts on land and so it's, it's also tied together and there are all these different tipping points that have all different ways. We have uh, um, a good friend of mine who runs the five minute beach cleanup and has gone now global. And the amount of plastic they pull out on, on every time they go to the beach, it's just amazing. But we're at the end of the, of the thing. And that's what Randall said. If we keep on just cleaning up the beaches, and Coca-Cola can still produce all those plastic bottles that are thrown out. Totally. We won't stop it. So we need to change humanity. And that's why regeneration is holistic. It's at all levels. It's political. It's social. It's cultural. We have to quit buying these, these uh, drinks and disposable water. We have to quit buying all this one-way plastic uh, that ends up in the oceans. And so but I'll pass it on. I don't know if Max wants to go first or Randall, but whoever... Uh, to go yeah. more on the... Yeah, no, I think it, um, you touched on many things uh, that are true. The, the most critical part is actually how all of those things act together. Um, you know, because we tend to think about this in a separate way. But when you have a coral reef that is actually, you know, um, is dealing with uh, the rays of the, um, of the temperature, which is affecting and, and creating some of the bleaching of the coral, but then you have this chemical comes in, you know, like all the fertilizers and, and the blooming and, and then also the um, soil from, you know, uh, from, from the rivers as you were showing uh, earlier at the beginning, that all act together over fishing, you know, <laughs> fishing all this, these critical animals for that coral reef. So the coral reefs have a lot less capacity to resist. Um, I, I think we need to see this, our, our, our kind of impact together and not just anymore. You know, we are talking about, for example, the climate change, but we know also we have a crisis on the bio, uh, biodiversity. We, we have an incredible rate of losing biodiversity around the world. And mm -hmm. both actually, this discussion, uh, uh, it was a certain point together, no? Um, Rio brought the, 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 you know, the, all the conversation together. 
but then it's separated in two different um, uh, negotiations. That doesn't mean <laughs> that we, you know, that we can solve one and not the other. We need to solve all, all of it, all of it. And and the source of all of this is is us. Um, so the good news is because it's us, we are the ones we can actually change that. Um, you know, like I, we you've seen all of this. Um, cartoons talking about the the dinosaurs no they had no chance they, they had no possibility to change you know the course of a meteorite we we have the chance we have the capacity to actually change our behavior um i mean it would be extremely stupid if we finally you know um destroy this planet and humanity when we were in charge of changing it um so so i think on on on, on that i mean with all of these tipping points at least we need to remember we have still the capacity. We know the tools to actually fix it, um, and but it's critical that we start yesterday. No, I mean we we are we might be late, but we still have those tools and we still have the capacity to do it. Now, Max, you're you're there at at the COP, right? Because I I was wondering, is there any of this yes, discussion correct. happening there? We've heard about. Uh, protocols on methane and deforestation, but at least in terms of the popular media, there's been almost no mention of the oceans in any way. Well, Jim, for um, over 25 years, uh, there have no been discussion about the ocean as part of the climate. That's what I was exactly was uh, I was telling you. Yeah, it's yeah. like we tend to see these things apart. No, it's like yeah, yeah. <laughs> 75% of, of the planet is covered by, by water. And then we, 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 we're not talking about that. The biggest sinking, you know, body is a sinking of carbon body in, in, in the planet have not been part of that discussion. And so um, in the previous COP actually, and, 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 and I was also working on that. I've been, you know, part of the champions team also of the UK and Chile and, and before also in, in the Chile COP we were able to name it uh, uh, the Blue Cup because it was the first time that actually a text was included into the, um, uh, into the Paris Agreement about the ocean. And so there's still more work to do on how that will be included, but we were able for <laughs> after 25 years to actually get something in there through, through Chile and the work that we were doing. Uh, so we need to continue, we will continue, we will, you know, this is endurance. Uh, this, this is not just, you know, as Obama was saying yesterday, <laughs> this is really a marathon now um, of work. Um, I mean, I hope we all understand our role in, in this, uh, the role of business, it's crucial. And I think we've seen some, some interesting things this, this last week. Um, I was in meetings, you know, where Bezos, for example, was meeting with the four countries uh, that make the announcement. And he promised a lot of resources for that area. We've been also able to put together all the resources. There is a lot more interest from business, but not enough, far, far from being enough. No, I mean, the, the, the amount of money that some of them have been making out of destroying the world, I think it need to also be reflected on how much we actually going to put to, to restore it, to, to bring it back this, that is important for humanity. Yeah. Randall, you were going to say something about the oceans at tipping point. Oh, you're you're on you're, mute. You're on mute. Yeah. Okay. As as everyone has mentioned, there's many different tipping points that we're reaching, and it's all coming together. You know, it's not just one single issue. But you know, I work on the shark issue, and you know, the way I see it is, you know, there's matters that we can take care of now and there's matters going to take that are going to take a little longer like you know the fuel consumption and cutting down on on you know the production of co2 and all that that's unfortunately going to take longer than than we need you know this is an impelling issue but you know these agreements aren't really taking it as far as we need you know right now so basically you know we're talking about climate change and I've seen that now most of the discussion is, well, climate change is happening or it's, it's happened and we need to adapt. And we're thinking about the future. We need to adapt to these changes because they're coming. And to adapt to these changes, 
We need the ecosystems to be resilient. So we're talking about the future and to adapt to these future changes that are coming and some have arrived. We need the oceans to be resilient. And what does that mean? We need the oceans, their ecosystems to be complete and full so that the oceans can adapt to these, to these um, changes that are coming. The more acidification and you know, more of these problems are coming. We need the ocean to be able to adapt, to be resilient. But if we're wiping the sharks out now, in the future, the oceans won't be able to be resilient. So, you know, there are actions that we can take now. And one of them is, and all the governments of the world need to take this seriously. We need to stop commercializing endangered shark species. We have them on international conventions. We have them on different appendixes, but everybody keeps on fishing them out. And if we don't do something about that now, the oceans aren't going to be resilient in the future. And that makes all this talk about climate change empty. We need to do something now about these sharks. And it's something that we can do now. You know, these, some of these other issues are a lot more difficult to deal with. But we can deal with the extension of sharks now. That's why we put them on the, on the conventions. But for many reasons, nothing is getting implemented for shark conservation. They keep on being pushed to extinction. And, you know, so... Why are we going to these climate meetings and talking about resilience and adaptation if we're not taking the measures now so the oceans can adapt? Thanks. Yeah, um, there, there's a question about uh, using kelp as a possible solution. Uh, I don't know if any of you know about the kelp. I've seen a few articles, but I know seagrasses and, and seagrass beds are a huge source for capturing carbon. Now, in this uh western world ocean um or the blue carbon hasn't been the highlight as forest carbon has mainly because uh who owns the ocean floor and who gets the money and the payments for the carbon there's been a lot of discussion in mangrove conservation in blue carbon conservation um but i don't know if, if you have any any idea about the kelp and um how we can actually stimulate these initiatives uh, of getting a higher resilience in the ocean. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's really with direct actions, except for example, with the sharks, but we need to act at the whole global level and reverse a lot of the things that end up, the ocean is our open sewer. Um, mm -hmm. Even Costa Rica, 80% of our sewer from the cities goes directly to the ocean. If you, if you think of that and you think you're eating the fish and the shrimp that are eating this, uh, but we don't look at the oceans. Many of the countries just gave the back to the oceans and we don't mind throwing the sewer in there or any wastewater or any anything. So it's not only about plastic, it's the whole thing. So yeah, um, Edward, that is a very interesting thing that you're mentioning because we, we've had a lot of talk this uh, week and we've been actually working for a while, we are um, getting together with Parley and um, Sea Change uh, from South Africa, the people that made the uh, My Octopus T-shirt movie. Um, if you haven't seen the movie, I highly recommend you to see it too. Uh, actually, also, I was yesterday with Ali, the director and protagonist of the um, Seaspiracy 2. It's a, it's a good friend of mine. Another movie that someone was mentioning there too, that you should see it too. Uh, Kelp Forest have been now singled out as one of probably the most important ecosystems on earth to capture carbon. Um, the problem is how to measure where that carbon can be measured, <laughs> you know? I mean, in the trees, of course, you go and you, you measure the bar, I mean, like the, the, the wood, where is the carbon uh, sequester. Um, but on the kelp, it's a little bit more difficult because most of it then goes drift maybe down into canyons or other places might be used into other ecosystems too um, so it is, it is critical we understand more about that but at the same time i mean one of the things that we sometimes forget to remember is kelp forests have an incredible capacity to do many things um, and as many forests actually it's capable of containing incredible amount of biodiversity 
Um, the, the kelp forest you've seen, probably many of you in, in California, and the kelp forest of North America, has been disappearing. 95% of it, it's gone already. And that's because, as Randa was saying, you know, we need to stop the killing. We didn't stop the killing on time for uh, sea otters uh, that were taken for their fur um, by Russians, by Americans, you know, for the trade years ago. They never recover back uh, to the point that now, you know, the, the, the kelp forest is disappearing and will disappear, um, sadly, in North America. A whole ecosystem will be gone with it. Um, many species that only can live in that kelp forest will go on. So yes, it is important to give um, an economic value and in particular now that we're talking about the carbon sequestration capacity to that, but how to put a value onto the value of, of an ecosystem like, like kelp forest, you know? And, and, and we are trying to imagine, we, we were having good discussions yesterday in a private meeting we have and actually need to go now to another exactly about kelp forests with other people, with, with Carlos Duarte, um, is a very well-known scientist also who's been working on, on, on this. He's probably the biggest authority on, on kelp forests. Um, and so we've been talking about how do we actually put together something that protect the, the, uh, the kelp forest rather than just using it as, um, you know, uh, again, for food or for um, uh, creams or even cosmetics and everything. But what is the value of actually leaving the kelp forest doing what he's been doing? Um, just to mention also, the kelp forest is capable of changing the uh, acidification of the, of the ocean. So the places where there is kelp forest, it actually, the acidification that has been affecting the ocean because of the climate change is not the same. It has the capacity to buffer those areas. So we, we're just learning. We just hear from the IMF, you know, the whales are huge carbon sinking to, of course, everything, every life, all this fish, all the micro, uh, you know, life that lives in the ocean that produce most of the oxygen, that produce most of, the, of life on Earth, it is actually also um, a, a way to actually capture carbon. So we need to think in that holistic way for sure, but we are learning a lot. Key message, you can put value on nature, but you can't put a price on all of nature. And I think that was a mistake that we made when we started working on ecological economics and trying to put a price on everything. And that actually opened the door to a lot of dark businesses of compensating. And yeah, I'll pay for the damage. And it's not the damage, it's, it's life. We're looking at regenerating life. Uh, the future of the planet is there if we regenerate life, if we put humanity in service of life and not on top of the life. So we are not the top, we're not the apex species, uh, we're, or we shouldn't be, uh, we should be in service of life. Um, Jim, I think you wanted to say something else or? Well, I was just gonna underscore uh, Max's comment about the documentaries. I saw Sea Spiracy when it came out and I, I found that to be one of the most shocking exposés I think I've ever seen you know, and the depictions of these trawlers that go in the clear cutting of the ocean floor. Uh, something like 46 billion acres of the ocean have been clear cut. And, you know, uh, upwards of 40, 50% of all the catches or bycatches. So they just throw these dead fish back into the ocean. It was, it broke my heart many times over. And that was another question I wanted to ask uh, all of you is, uh, from what the documentary said, this clear cutting, uh, you know, massive commercial clear cutting of the oceans for fish is continuing unimpeded. And the mining, the deep Correct. sea mining that's coming up, lithium oh, yeah. and other, other minerals. Yeah. They're going to the ocean floor where they can do all the damage. Nobody's yeah. seeing it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, when you, when you look, for example, on the, uh, on the trim, you know, and, and Randall knows very well there, too, that uh, they finally uh, stopped the, uh, the bottom trolling. You know, it was, it's been a, a long um, fight, but uh, if you eat um, a shrimp, you need to know first that if that shrimp was fished uh, through bottom trolling, probably that shrimp is 
one percent of 99 other species that were dead because of that shrimp was taken so the the impact of taking that shrimp on your plate have it is pure destruction in the ocean pure destruction of of diversity things that we, we might not even know are really because they were lost on that um process and then some of the shrimp is being cultivated in places where most of them have been um, able to be built out of destruction of mangroves. So in order to do the pools where this uh, shrimp is uh, produced, um, they've been cutting big industries again. They've been cutting the mangroves to make these incredible places that, um, you know, that has been destroyed. <laughs> now, what, now what we know is one of the most also important uh, ecosystem for carbon storage. So, so you, we need to we need to know more about it. Everyone needs to know more about our impact. We can't just go to the supermarket and buy some. That has a cost. All the things that we do, and and of course it's difficult. We we, we all we always have an impact, uh, for sure. But how to minimize that impact? I think is it is critical. And so there are things that we, maybe we should not, but others maybe that we we, we can. And I think it's a it's, it's a very difficult question of our time because we're a big population that will continue growing and we'll keep having more access to many other things too. Yeah, I would just mention too that something that has to change globally is the way we manage bycatch. And mm -hmm. what bycatch technically means is it's something unintended. You wanted to catch tuna, you wanted to catch mahi-mahi, and you caught a shark or you caught a turtle. You know, so it's incidental, it's bycatch. We didn't want to, but we got it here. So what has the approach been? Well, since I caught it, I might as well eat it because if I throw it away, it'll be a waste. You know, and that argument probably holds water when it's truly a bycatch. So for instance, if you go out there and you catch 20 tunas and you caught one shark, okay, that shark was bycatch. You didn't want to catch it, but you caught it. It doesn't matter if you bring it to port, but let's go back to the shrimp trawl industry. When you drag a shrimp trawl net on the bottom of the ocean, here in Costa Rica at least, only two to 5% of everything you catch by weight is shrimp. 95% of everything you catch is bycatch, and about 70% of that is small fish. And lots of this fish is retained by the fishermen, and that's actually how they make ends meet. Not because of the shrimp, but they make ends meet with all the fish they catch as bycatch. So in reality, it's a fish trawl industry. They might be going for shrimp, but if they're only catching 5% at best shrimp, I would say shrimp is the bycatch and they're really catching fish. See, so, but the thing is fishery administrators always twist that word around when you go to these fishery meetings, to these regional fishery management organization meetings, and they always twist it around to where bycatch means we can't do anything about it. And when you look at our long line industry, for instance, the same thing happens. Uh, during several months of the year, it's a mahi fishery and most of what they land is mahi. But there's five or six months of the year when there's no mahi, mahi is seasonal. And during those five, six months of the year, 80% of the, of the long landing landing, of the long line landings is shark. And they're making their profits off the silky shark, shark fins. So five or six months of the year, technically speaking, Costa Rica operates a shark targeted fishery. But when you say this in Costa Rica, oh, no, it's not. It's a mahi fishery. Shark are incidental. Why are you fishing mahi when there's no mahi? Well, because we have to fish, we have to eat. And we're catching these 80% incidental shark catch. And it's like, you're targeting sharks. Oh, no, we're not. It's a mahi fishery. So it becomes, it becomes a circular discussion to where bycatch is just a convenient word to say you can't do anything about it and you keep on catching it without remorse. And that's what needs to change. That's what's happening with the tuna industry. Like I said, the tuna seem to be going, doing a little better now, but the sharks are still, still being pushed to extinction with that same shark fishing effort. I mean, with the same fishing effort. So what needs to change is we have to treat these animals as a catch. It's not bycatch, it's a catch and it's a mortality. And we, when yeah. we address it that way, it's a catch and it's a mortality of a critically endangered species that must be protected, then we can start moving forward on this discussion. 
But as long as it's bycatch, we can't do anything about it. And it doesn't depend on the amount you're catching. It's just a bycatch. It's just a buzzword to get around the regulations and to keep on doing business as usual. That's what needs to change. Well, and someone's just put in the uh, chat, uh, Randall, uh, Jacob Matthew, that uh, when they fish for shark, they go for the fin often and uh, cut the fin off and then throw the shark back. So they kill the shark for the fin. Uh, so they don't even take everything that they've caught. Yeah. Well, you know, that, that strategy kind of backfired on me. You know, the, the organization we work, I work with now is called Fins Attached. Um, and that name came from our big battles starting the year 2000. Uh, we were just starting our shark conservation work and we still didn't know the, you know, the, the, the status of the shark populations, but we did know that shark finning was bad. And, you know, back then in the year 2000, we were still talking about sustainable use of sharks. So we would say, well, if you're going to catch a shark, use the whole thing. Don't fin it. Don't cut the fin off and bring the body and, and, and throw the body and only commercialize the fin. Even though we're sure that lots of that still must be going on in Costa Rica, at least the only way you can legally land sharks is if the fins are attached. And what happened with that was that the merchants now are pushing all this shark meat on the Costa Rican consumers. Costa, Costa Ricans used to not eat shark and Costa Rica, you know, shark meat used to be frowned upon, but now they sell the shark meat to the Costa Ricans with all these different names, because if they have to land the shark with the, with, with the fins attached, then they have all this protein, all this meat, and they push it on the consumers with different names. So now we have to tell everybody, don't eat shark, and shark is sold as cason, it's, it's sold as bolillo. And here in Costa Rica, during four or five months of the year, you can go to the supermarket and buy, and buy really nice, baby, critically endangered hammerhead shark fillets and go make ceviche out of them. You can legally buy them in the docks, you can buy them in the supermarkets, if the commercialization of these animals is open in Costa Rica. It's only illegal to export the products, but you can keep on killing them and commercializing them in Costa Rica. So, of course, that has no conservation benefit. I would like to be just be on the way to closing. Um, actually, I wanted this to be a positive. <laughs> a meeting of good stories and, and it's a, it's unavoidable that with the situation we're living that we land in the negative parts but um maybe we could just have a round of positive news positive expectations i think we need to give hope i have a nine-year-old and if i tell him all these stories he doesn't have a future and he loves the ocean he loves to go on the rocks and look so we need we need to have inspiration we need to give hope and I know both of you are really, and you talked a little bit about that, but to close on the upside of marine uh, future, uh, if we can get a, a message of, of both of you, and I'm really sorry, Carolina didn't make it. She, she's a, a young uh, scientist and, and also works uh, actually very closely to Randall. I wanted to hear a, a youth voice, a female youth voice that is fighting for the oceans, but uh, her electricity is still out. Um, but if we could just go to that final positive uh, end message, yeah. I think we need it. <laughs> Give yeah. us some hope, Max, Randall. No, absolutely. And, and I think, um, you know, we, we tend to fall into, into this spiral, but um, I, I see a lot of positive uh, right now. I'm, I mean, for me, it's been extremely positive, this announcement last week. Um, getting four, four presidents together to do this announcement and, and they're working actually currently and we continue talking this week uh, with the ministers and everyone um, of this multinational first marine protected area. I think, it is, I think it is an incredible positive thing. It is positive to have people like Randall actually. Um, Randall has been fighting for many years and having an energy a few times I've seen you know, in, 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 in anywhere. I mean, um, and, and he is doing incredible work um, and, and, you know, he's fighting for the, for the sharks and he's fighting for the sea turtles and he's fighting for this marine protectors, this announcement in the part of, of Costa Rica. And I know he, 
um, he have his doubts about the, uh, the how Costa Rica will do it. But I'm, I, I, I am pretty sure it's gonna. This is gonna happen in the, the couple next month. And and I think it's, it wouldn't happen if it wouldn't be for people like you, Edward, um, who've been you know teaching us and 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 helping us for many years. To me and many others, it wouldn't happen because of um, uh, people. I mean, it wouldn't happen if we wouldn't have people like Randall. Um, and and there are many, 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 many more heroes. I mean, I see it. It keeps growing. I mean. It, the, the amount of, of attention of this, um, this the whole week has been, I've been in, you know, The Guardian, in um, the Wall Street Journal. I mean, Wall Street Journal, two years ago, wouldn't have been writing about Marine Corps the Darius. It did not. It did not. I mean, something has changed. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, the, the other day when the um, uh, expansion of Galapagos uh, happened, the country risk of Ecuador change it went down meaning that actually business and the world saw that Ecuador was doing something good how we have changed you know the the, the even like those measures now those measures includes conservation includes protection um what oh, many of of us have seen this week actually um, I know there's a lot of news about like how negative, you know, this could be and how far still we are, but I've seen a completely different cup this time here. Um, the, the, the feeling and the urgency and the pressure over uh, the decision makers here have been incredibly different, very, very different than many other times. i um, seeing youth like, you know, um, uh, not just Greta, but so many other young people coming here, kids and talking and wanting to talk to authorities. It's putting so much pressure and it's been beautiful. We are all part of it. We left it for a long time on their devices. And I think we are now kind of taking control back. And I think those are things that we need to celebrate too. We, we can make it. We are doing a lot of these things. We need more. Yes, for sure. Sure. Absolutely. But we are doing a good job in many ways. And I think we need to celebrate that ourselves and many of these people like Randall and Edward and many of you for sure. Thank you. Okay, I, I would just like to add that um, it's a matter of political will. And these four presidents recently signing this statement to, to increase the protection of, these, of the Eastern Tropical Pacific is definitely good news. But what we really need to do now, and I, I call on everybody listening on this, on, the, on this conversation, we have to put the pressure on the president. We have to let the president of Costa Rica know that he has the full support of the Costa Rican people and of the international conservation community to do this. And we expect them to do this. He's also under a lot of pressure not to do it. That's why we have to be the forces behind and he already made this announcement. He made this international commitment. So let's make sure he stands next to this international commitment and let's, let's mobilize the whole world on, on the Costa Rica and on the president. And let's let the president know that this is what the world expects him to do. And you know, so you know, let's, let's encourage him to do it. So he knows that he, has, he can be confident that he has the support of the whole world to move forward and that there will be no backlash. And any back, backlash will be repelled by the support of you know, the whole world, because this is what needs to be done and Costa Rica needs to do it. So yeah, help me everybody, Let, let's go for this. Let's do it, let's do it. Jim, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Ed, uh, thank you, Randall, thank you, Max. Uh, this has been sobering and inspiring at the same time. Uh, and I wanna really express my appreciation for this. And I'd like, uh, Ed, to have us back for a deeper dive, as it were, into the oceans. Because I think, you know, the fact that 26 cops could go by and the oceans are barely mentioned means that we as civil society needs, we need to do more uh, to bring this to people's attention. And Randall, you know, we could do a whole session just on sharks. Oh, yeah. You know, people uh, people love sharks, and then people, uh, I think, intuitively understand what your central message is: is that you know, as the 
as the top of the food chain, they, they're in some ways critical to the entire food chain uh, in the oceans. So I'd like to uh, have uh, more uh, 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 sessions on uh, the ocean if uh, the three of you and others, Ed, that you could bring in would be inclined to uh, participate because it's, it's, just, it's just so, so critical. Uh, and you're right, there, there's so many different tipping points in the ocean all happening at the same time. And most people don't even know it's occurring. So uh, this has been a very important uh, session. So uh, thank you all. Uh, tomorrow, we're gonna be talking with uh, folks uh, in a parallel universe of the Amazonia and the rainforest, which like the oceans, play a critical role in the overall planetary ecology. And almost without exception, rainforests uh, everywhere in the world are under uh, dramatic assault by commercial uh, interests, uh, essentially unimpeded, um, particularly there in Brazil. We'll be hearing from Marina Silva, uh, first up tomorrow from Brazil and others uh, who are on the front lines of the uh, crusade to save that massive rainforest, which really serves as the lungs of the earth. So that'll be tomorrow on Humanity Rising. But Ed, Randall, uh, Max, uh, thank you all so much. Max, good luck with everything there uh, in Glasgow. And uh, we will uh, see everybody same time, same station tomorrow uh, for uh, climate change uh, in Amazonia. Bye for now. Muchas gracias. Mucho gracias.